good afternoon everyone thank you today's all participants today is the fourth day of five day national level virtual research academic skill development program today's topic will be discussed by dr rajesh singh university librarian delhi university on 21st information skills before deliberation of topic i requested to dr nimay chand saha biswabharati university librarian to give uh, welcome speech sir okay uh, thank you pradeep uh, at the very outset let me welcome to our uh, today speaker who is supposed to be one of the figure in indian abroad lis service and science too and to whom i respect much and to whom i get guide whenever i feel so that is none other than respected dr rajesh singh and he is at present supposed to be the university librarian and in spite of his busy schedule yes the last week when i called him he just asked me okay dr saha i will be there with your platform without thinking twice how it is when it is no there is no question so that is why the persons like uh, dr rajesh singh is catering library services and nurturing library professionals with his ever kind and cordial attitude and we on behalf of bishwabharati is not out of his umbrella of cordiality so sir thank you and welcome for accepting our invitation and enlightening us with very suitable and pertinent topic information skills in 21st century and let me also welcome all of my colleagues of bishwabharati library network section library central library and the students faculty members in and out bishwabharati in one way it's national and sometimes i may call it as international level because sometimes i found that egypt then uh, bangladesh nepal some participants joined over here and considering the paucity and confinement of the academia since it is class examination laboratory going on that is why bishwabharati library intend to upload every lecture in the youtube channel so that it will be made available to not only bishwabharati fraternity but also any community of those who are living in the knowledge society will be able to view this video and i am sure they will be immensely benefited by today's very pertinent and timely uh, topic that is information skills in 21st century so without sparing much time because singh sir is very busy every now and then he has to attend different meetings administrative meetings professional meetings in and out daily and of course other than his daily university assignment mm -hmm. so i don't want to yeah i don't want to uh, uh, lose much time of uh, singh sir uh, because everybody is waiting to listen him and before to handing over singh sir uh, let me request my colleague sir ramprasad mojumdar who is aside with me and who is supposed to be in scientist of our library and singh sir will be happy to know he is the pillar of my uh, technological innovation of bishwabharati library so i request him to introduce that's a matter of courtesy and is profound gratitude to singh sir to introduce uh, singh sir before his deliberation before the audience so ram prasad sir please thank you thank you divaza very good evening to everyone it has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event nimada told me to introduce uh, dr rajesh singh and i was searching in the website and uh, go to the hearings i got the big big profile of him so it is uh, not required to uh, introduce uh, him he is a great profile and good person and great person i mean that i got this some information about him and uh, he is a good librarian also dr rajesh singh uh, presently serving as university librarian and head dls university of delhi he is a gold medalist from banaras hindu university dr singh has served indian school of mines dhanbad mjp royal khan university bareilly and dr rm l abad university faizabad 
before moving to university in Delhi. His area of interest and specialization includes information literacy and competency and www worldwide web resources on online information retrieval techniques, meta and federated searching and etc. etc. He has many publications. There are journal articles, book chapter, book, conference proceedings, and online social and conference proceedings and conference poster also. He is now is acting as a university librarian and also head of the DLSQS. So thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, now you can take your platform and go ahead. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to Dr. Nimai Chan Saha and his colleagues for inviting me. Uh, I'm not sure uh, because he has talked too high about me. Uh, I'm not sure whether I um, deserve this or not, but I'm sure that the participants, once they spend their 40, 45 minutes uh, in this program, I'm sure they will learn a lot. And this learning uh, is a learning for life. It's a learning for uh, research and academics, and it's a learning for life. So friends, today uh, I will be discussing with you uh, what are the information skill, uh, uh, what are the information skills which are essential in today's information environment? Uh, when we say 21st century, so we have a shift, paradigm shift from uh, the existing information environment to this new information environment. Now, what it is, uh, I believe you can see the change of my slides. Uh, can anybody confirm? If you are able to see the change of my slide. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. We are in the okay. second slide, digital information okay. landscape. Okay. Okay. So this uh, digital information landscape today in 21st century has seen a sea change. What we have, we have a lot number of information, uh, uh, particularly that information is being published in digital format now. Earlier it was published in print. Now it is being published more and more in digital format. And we have a network digital information environment. You have access to everything with a quick, a bit a click of uh, uh, your mouse, right? So what we have, we have abundance of information. You Google any query and you will find so much of results. Then again, it becomes uh, difficult for you as a user of information, what to read and what to leave, right? You know, in that sense, as, per the, uh, as, as far as the availability of information is concerned, in that sense, today's researchers are information privileged. If you talk about uh, the research 20 years back, a researcher has to move from one place to other place, from one library to other library to find uh, citations, references, and full text document for his, his or her research. But in today's time, the researchers are information privileged. You have access to variety of information. Uh, the information you require is readily available to you, right? And with this availability of information, with the availability of tools like Google, there is uh, some behavioral changes in the user of information. And the researchers and uh, today, they are habitual of accessing the information effortlessly. And they try to find out the information as soon as they want, they need the information in a very quick way, right? So the today's information environment provides ease and speed for information retrieval. And the researchers, because of this, they are habitual of getting the information effortlessly. This environment, has various advantages, as well as there are certain threats of abuse and misuse of the abundance of information which is available to you. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the open access resources which are in plenty on the net, as well as I'm also referring, I'm also talking about uh, the huge investment which universities and other 
higher educational institutions are making in subscription of databases in perpetual purchase of the ebooks so this uh, digital platform is entirely different what we have learned for the physical platform for the print books that is something which is not required here on the digital platform now the question is how as a researcher as a scholar as a student as a faculty member how can we survive with the availability of pertinent information when i talk about survival i refer to precise information which is as per your requirement see if you go to the google and make a query it will provide you hundreds and thousands of results you know that seems that you are on the door of a library if you go to a library and if you look for something you will get one two or tens of uh, 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 pieces of information not like hundreds and thousands of information right so if you talk about the precise retrieval of information the google fails here but this is a general understanding that if we look for something we get hundreds and thousands of results from search engines like google now the question comes who is responsible is it google or is, is it the user of information you know it is we the user of information who is responsible for retrieving hundreds and thousands of results for a query because we as a user of information we are not using the precise features which are available in a search engine like google or any other search engine a search engine from a database and and if you referred in that case if you look for something in science direct which is the most revered which is the most important database for science uh, technology and medicine there also if you look for something uh, not in a very precise way you will get lot of results which is again uh, confusing for you now as a researcher as a user of information what kind of skill sets we are required to have what kind of learning we need to inculcate in ourselves so that we can survive academically we can flourish in our research and publications friends these are the five skill sets uh which are essential today for your survival in the new information landscape and i refer them as information skills for 21st century now the first of this is information need you may not realize when i say you may not realize that uh, many a times we are not in a position even the senior scientists and scholars they are not in a position to precisely define what exactly they want they are not in a position and this is particularly in case of digital information landscape i will explain it to you i'm sure you may not agree to me on at this stage but later on uh, when i give you examples you will say yes this is there then uh, the second skill set is information access see finding hundreds and thousands of results for one query is not a proper way of accessing the information i am sure all of us we look for the first result page in the google if we are more interested we go to the second page if we are further more interested we go to the third page of the result and very rarely we go to the fourth page and i think we never go beyond fourth or fifth page uh, what is there what do you think there are no relevant results no this is not the case there are relevant results we fail to find those relevant results on the first page or second page or third page because we are not making the query properly right and google is only an example this could be the case with all the search engines even with the subscribed databases so what we need we need to learn how we can be precise in making our query to retrieve precise information as per our requirement right and then the third skill set refers to information evaluation our friends uh, and i'm sure those who are from uh, library and information science you might be aware that whatever is available on the net is uh, uh, everything is not reliable everything is not authentic there is lot of misinformation 
there is large number of good information but there are a lot of misinformation there are a lot of information of uh, with different purposes besides the academics right so as a user of end user of information we need to develop the skill how we can evaluate the information which we are particularly getting from open access what is the reliability what is the authenticity of that uh, piece of information this is very essential otherwise you will quote from a document which is in itself is questionable right so information evaluation skills are again very important and then the fourth set of uh, skills which speaks about information use see uh, in research particularly if you try to use a piece of information which you have not understood you are going to commit plagiarism your understanding of that piece of information is essential to incorporate that information for a particular purpose in your writing in a particular context unless you precisely understand the information you not you won't be able to do it and this has been the practice of the particularly the researchers for the in the thesis and dissertations right so understanding of information is very important for precise and contextual use of information for a particular purpose and when we come for information use ethics friends uh, 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 this is broad but if i speak of plagiarism this is something which is haunting the minds of scholars today in our country but as a researcher if there are researchers participating in this webinar i am sure you will learn how to precisely be yourself in your research report without without plagiarizing any content from any document from any source so these are the five skill sets which are important for your academic your research survival in the 21st century now coming to the information need i told you you may not agree to me at this juncture of time at this point of time but later on when we go with step by step you will find yes uh, many a times we are not uh, we have never thought of such a, a systematic approach to putting a query to a search system and retrieving precise information now i want to look something in a search engine it could be anything google or any search engine with any database <clears throat> so what i need to do uh, i have um, um, stated some uh, steps and this is for your purpose uh, this is not always that you need to go step by step always but these steps are very important for your understanding so the first step is state what you want to find note down on a piece of paper what exactly you are looking for here are two examples cognitive architecture of the depressed and the second example is globalization and its impact on the indian working class i i request you to take the third example also because it will help me to explain uh, the third example is economic development in india this is very simple economic development in india so these are the three examples uh, i three different users want to retrieve information on these three examples the second step is to identify the keywords in your natural language whatever your requirement is there on the piece of paper identify what are the keywords so in the case of these two examples the keywords are cognitive architecture and depressed in the first example in the second example the keywords are globalization and indian working class some of you may not agree with me and you may opine that uh, even the impact should be a keyword now from information science uh, uh, point of view impact is a term which is implied in the meaning and because of that it is not a keyword for example if i try to find if i if i get a paper research paper which has the title globalization and indian working class that paper will definitely discuss the impact or effect of globalization on indian working class right so if we put impact 
as a keyword we won't be able to retrieve that paper where only globalization and indian working class is there right so this impact is implied in the meaning now coming to the third example economic development in india the keywords are very simple economic development and india now the third step is to select the synonymous terms and variant word forms when i speak about variant variant word forms uh, these are the singulars and plurals these are the different spellings american and british spellings for the same word right and when we talk about synonymous see you know synonymous terms play a very important role in information organization and information retrieval right so now we take the third example economic development in india to find out the synonymous terms so the keywords are economic development and india now what could be the synonymous terms to economic development there are terms like growth and progress so economic development or economic growth or economic progress see growth progress and development in literal meaning could be something different but as far as information seeking is concerned as far as the interest of the researcher is concerned they the researcher could find relevant information even with the term growth and progress even if he is looking for development right so keeping that point in mind we have three more synonymous uh, uh, two more synonymous terms growth and develop uh, growth and progress now what we have we have three more set uh, two more sets of keywords economic development economic growth economic progress and the last one is india now the question is are we required to find uh, those keywords separately no not at all we are required to combine them together by using boolean operators right by using boolean operators we need to construct one search engine one search statement and find the information which is located in a particular database right so how do, how we can do see there are three major boolean operators and or and not so if you use the boolean operator not with any of the term which you are looking for in, uh, which you are searching in your search query it simply means that that term will not appear in your search results say for example you might be looking for pets p e t s pets but you are not interested in cats so what you can say pets not cats so that term cats will be will not be coming as a part of your results uh, when you are searching like this now there are two other uh, uh, operators and or see when you use and you use and to combine two things together it simply means you are looking for both the things this and this so what the search engine will do the search engine will find both the concepts and retrieve only those papers where both the concepts are there that means and limits your limits the number of results for your search query whereas if you put the term or 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 it broadens your search query this or this so where wherever both the terms are there they will be searched wherever either of the terms are there they will be searched and will be part of your query so and limits your search whereas or broadens your search right in given example the third example the search statement will be economic development or economic growth or economic progress and india you know what we are doing we are instructing the search engine to look for economic development in india or economic growth and in india or economic progress and in india so this way we are finding all the information which is there in a database now you think for a while if we are not analyzing for the synonymous terms what we are doing we are only looking for economic development we are only retrieving the documents 
where authors have used the term economic development. And we are leaving all the papers where the authors have, instead of using the term development, they have either used the term growth or the term progress, right? So if you are not analyzing your query, if you are not trying to ascertain the synonymous terms, what you are doing? You are leaving the information where the same synonymous terms might have been used by the scholars, by the authors. Now, the next step is give a context. See, a generalized search statement will retrieve large number of results. So we need to be very precise in, in constructing our search query. If your search query is not precise, the number of results will be high. Now, how we, how we can make a precise search query? <coughs> this is one of the way. If you give a context to your search query, you are limiting your search query to that context and retrieval will be very precise. Retrieval of information will be very precise. For example, this is the term genetic mutation. A scholar is looking for information on genetic mutation. And you know, whatever steps I'm, I'm telling you, it is the end user who can decide what is what, what exactly he requires. So when a researcher is searching information on genetic mutation, the researcher has to decide. See, generally, he might be interested in one. What one? Generally, genetic mutation can take place in humans, animals, and plants. Right? So the researcher might be generally interested in one, genetic mutation of humans or plants or animals. But if you search for genetic mutation, as it is without a context, you will retrieve information which deals with all the entities. So you, you can give a context, uh, genetic mutation with human or animals or plants. Now coming to the second example here, a researcher is looking for information on for foreign direct investment. Now what kind of context he needs to give? See, FDI is a global phenomenon. It is not limited to our country or to any specific area of the world. It's a global phenomenon. So the user needs to find out he is looking for information on FDI related to which country. It could be India or it could be any country for indirect investment in a particular region or in a particular country, right? And then it is not something new. This is uh, 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 from decades. FDIs are uh, there from decades. So if a scholar is only interested in latest paper, he can give a period, right? In which period? The papers published during which period? So you can give a context of an area, of a nation, of a country, as well as of a period. And you know, mostly in subscribed databases like uh, uh, Science Direct, uh, like uh, Says Online, like Scopus, all these limiters and refinements are there that uh, we will discuss later. Now, this is the sixth step. Please check your spelling, proper spacing and proper punctuation. Friends, always remember a misspelled keyword will limit your search only to those documents where the same spelling mistake has taken place. Otherwise, you will find no results. Sorry, there is no result. There is no basis, right? Now, so I'm, I'm sure you might have understood that many a times, uh, even uh, uh, we are not able to precisely identify what exactly we are looking for, right? So this is important to identify what exactly you are looking for to make your search precise and find relevant results. Now coming to information access, uh, I'm sure all of you will agree that today we are overloaded. At the beginning also I told you that there is abundance of information. There is no doubt. Information is available in abundance, right? And we are overloaded. The entire world is information overloaded. 
So what to do? We need to understand what is the web? What kind of information is there on the web? So for easy understanding, I have divided web in three categories. The first part of the web, which is free and visible. When I say, when I say visible, it simply means which is uh, 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 indexable by the search engine spiders, which the search engines, particularly uh, the general search engines, part of the web, which uh, the general search engines are able to index, right? So whatever they index, we can see that. Whatever they are not able to index, we cannot see that. So the first uh, part is free and visible web, which is indexed by the general search engines. And the second part is that that part of free web, which is beyond uh, which is beyond the index of the general search engines. There could be various regions, right? So that part of free web, which is not indexed by the general search engines, that is called invisible web, right? And the th third category is the commercial databases or the pit databases over the web. There are few examples on the uh, screen. Uh, Science Direct is there, uh, Sage Online, Wiley, Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, lot more of J Store, EBSCO, lot more of databases are there which are commercial and which are accessible only on payment. Now, there are two more other concepts, search engine, you understand what it is. There is a concept of directories. We also refer them as subject portals, right? So directories or subject portals are the human listing for the invisible web to make it visible, right? So directories or subject portals are basically that part of the web which is invisible to the uh, uh, search engines and they are indexed to make it visible. Now, the question is, what is a search engine? It's a tool. Tool like, there are different tools we have been using in our day-to-day -day life. So these are the different tools we have been using. And search engine is a tool like this. You can see on the screen that there is a hammer and a nail. And this is, this we all have used in our life. But for the first time, when we try to put a nail on the wall with the hammer, almost all of us, we have injured ourselves. You know why? Because we were not aware how to use the hammer to put a nail on the wall. And similar is the case with the search engine. Unless you precisely understand how to use a particular search engine, you are harming yourself. This is as simple as it is. So what is, uh, 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 what is required from us? We need to learn what a search engine all about. What is the coverage of that database? What are the search features of that database and how you can? By spending 20, 25 minutes time, you read the help or the guide which is available on each and every search engine, whether it is open access search engine like uh, Google or a search engine associated with any of the paid databases or any of the commercial databases. Please try to find what is the coverage and what are the features. You know, almost uh, uh, 70 to 80 percent, uh, the features are similar, but the rest 20 to 30 percent will make the difference. So I advise you to spend your 20, 25 minutes time and reading on the help menu or the guide of the search engine. And you know what will happen? Your 20 minutes time spent first time or once, it will help you again and again whenever you are using that search engine for retrieval of information. And if you are not doing that, you are harming yourself. So it is better to be aware of what the search engine, search engine is all about and what are the features of that particular search engine. Here are some of the techniques uh, which will help you to find precise and relevant information when you are making search uh, through a search engine, whether it is open access or general search engine or a search engine affiliated to a database. Now, the first technique of information access is phrase search. 
In simple words, phrase search is a search where we are looking for all the words in the same order. And this is used particularly when we are, when we are looking for proper nouns, name of an individual, name of an association, organization, or like that. But it can also be used uh, to find information like uh, when uh, we talked about genetic mutation. Friends, you search the term genetic mutation in Science Direct. You will find many results where the term genetic mutation is together, but you will also find large number of results where either the term genetics is there or the term mutation is there, or if both the terms are there, they are not together, right? So to avoid all such situations, we can make a phrase search. Let me give you an example. If you search for Haribhan Sarai Bachchan, you will have in your results some information related to Amitabh Bachchan, Abhishek Bachchan, Jaya Bachchan, Aswarya Rai Bachchan. Why? Because the term Bachchan is common in them, in their names, right? If you look for William Shakespeare, you will find some information on William Wordsworth because the term William is common. To avoid all such things, what we can do? We can make them a phrase search. On advanced search page of a search engine, you have a window to make your search as a phrase. Even in Google also you have, uh, if you go to Google advance, you will find a window for making your search as a phrase search. But even in basic search, if you put double inverted commas to your query, it will be a phrase search and will retrieve information or the records or the results where all the terms in your search query are together in the same order, right? Now, the next technique is field search. Uh, friends, a piece of information has various fields and those who are from library science, you will really understand uh, that uh, searching information in a particular field as per the requirement is very important. For example, I'm looking uh, for some sonnets uh, or some dramas written by Shakespeare. So if I search for Shakespeare, I will get the term result for the term, wherever the term is in the subject, in the title, as an author, as a keyword, in the abstract. My requirement is what? I'm looking for some dramas, which is written by Shakespeare. Simple. I can limit my search to a field called author. So what I need to do? I need to search for Shakespeare as an author. What I'm doing? I'm leaving all the information on the term Shakespeare, which is in different fields. This is very simple. So if you look for genetic mutation in the title of the research paper, that is supposed to be more relevant than that term appearing in keywords or in abstract or anywhere in the full text, right? So in every uh, search engine, which is particularly associated, associated with the commercial databases, you have this facility on the advanced search page. You can define a field for your search query, right? You can define a field for your search query. And you know what difference it, it can make. You can make a search and you can find. Our Boolean operators we have already discussed and or not, what, what is the use of and, and or not. Proximity search refers to a search which is particularly available in JSTOR. JSTOR is database, commercial database. Uh, it allows you to find different terms in close proximity to each other. So that proximity could be of number of words, five words, 10 words, 20 words, 50 words like that. Or that proximity could be in a sentence, in a paragraph, on a page or like that, right? It helps you to find more precise information uh, from the abundance or plenty of information which is available. Now coming to control vocabulary. Uh, I'm sure those who are from library and information science, they can understand, but this is again very uh, easy for you to understand. See, in natural languages, we refer to the same concept in different ways. So when we say history of India or Indian history, it is the same thing, but we in a natural language, we are referring with different words, right? 
Now the question is how information could be organized and how it should be searched. So for that, the control vocabulary is there. Now for you, when you are looking for something in a search engine and the search engine suggests you something that you look for this, if you are interested in this, you look for this, that is the use of control vocabulary. So if you are typing something and something comes up as a pop-up, go for the pop-up because that is the control vocabulary which has been used by indexing the information by that search engine, right? And then comes concept map. Uh, it is again a uh, uh, um, system uh, technique which is prevalent in a reference database called Credo Reference. Now they are referring this to as a mind map and it allows you to find all the results on one single screen related to each other. What you can do, you can put your cursor on any of the term, you can find a brief information and if you are interested, click there and you can go to the full text. So this is a technological advancement, a technological assistance to the seekers of information to find relevant and precise information. Now, the question is, if you search for any query after, after uh, this lecture on number of steps, six steps, you are following all those six steps. You are also following uh, the techniques which I have uh, spoken to you, uh, the phrase search, the field search, the Boolean operators, everything. You have retrieved only 200 results for your query. I'm sure, even me, I'm also including myself, I'm sure none, none of us would read the 200 titles we are not in a position we are not interested to read those 200 results titles to identify what is relevant and what is not what to do then you can further once you have made a search not only 200 you have found 5000 results further you can refine your search how see I'm interested, say, for example, I'm interested in genetic mutation. As a scholar, I know, I, I, I wish to read a paper, research paper, which is published in a particular journal, title of the journal. Fine. Refine your search on genetic mutation out of 5,000 results. You find the name of, and you know, this is on every commercial search engine either but um, uh, it, it used to be on the left hand side of your screen particularly never i have seen on right hand side so on the left hand side there are provisions to refine your search results which you have searched already so how you can how you can refine you can refine by the title of the journal if you are interested in one two three four five journals you can select those journals and you can find the tabs for that and you can find research articles published on genetic mutation in those five journals. You might be interested in a particular scholar because uh, you are researching in that area. What you can do? You can limit your search to that scholar. You might be interested in reading only the latest research papers which are published in 2023 and 24. You can limit that. So even if you retrieve 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 results for your query. If you are in a position to define your requirement, again, I'm saying here also, if you are in a position to define your information requirement, precisely you want published, which is published in a particular journal, or you want, which is authored by a particular scholar, or you want something which is published in 2023-24, you could get the precise result. You don't have to deal with hundreds and thousands of results. You need to deal with 10 to 20 results if you are precise in expressing your information requirement. Coming to the third concept of information skills, this is information evaluation. Friends, 
we all know that whatever is available on the internet, everything is not academic, everything is not for research purpose. There are different things with different purposes, different objectives, right? There are sites to promote their sales and services. They will never speak of uh, uh, the academic content. There are sites which wants to promote viewpoints, right? So there are variety of uh, sites with different purposes. Now, what as a researcher, what as an academician, what you need to know to identify the authority, uh, the relevance of the paper for your academic use. So if you have retrieved a piece of information from the open access resources, try to find out who is the author, what is the authority of that paper, who is the authority of that paper, who is the author, what is his her credentials, to what kind of organization he is related to, and what else he or she has already published besides this paper. This will simply help you to identify whether this is a scholarly communication, uh, something written by a scholar, or something written by an amateur author, right? The second point for consideration is accuracy and coverage. You know, if you are a researcher, you can understand, you can identify the accuracy of the language. If the language is accurate, if the language is elegant, you can decipher it to be a reliable paper, right? If the coverage is complete, see, somebody, there is a document which speaks about thin films or thin servers, right? A document which speaks about thin servers and only talks about the advantages of the thin server could not be a document for academic use because the purpose is to sell, right? Because it speaks only for the advantages. The academic coverage is if there is an advantage, the limitation must be there, right? So try to identify what is the accuracy of the language, what is the coverage of the paper. If it speaks about the advantages, it should also speak about the limitations. Then try to identify and where you can identify this objective and purpose on the home page of the website through which you are retrieving your paper. Try to identify what is the basic objective, what is the purpose of that website. If it is an educational organization, something, uh, a research organization, you can use that information. But if it is a commercial site which, which wants to sell products or which is promoting some services or if it is some uh, political site which wants to promote some viewpoint, it could not be an academic piece of information from those sites, right? And then the last touchstone is currency, not the currency of the research paper and the content, but the currency of the website, whether it is up to date or not. See. If a website is not updated for last six months, if nobody is looking for last six months, you know, internet is the fastest medium of publication. You click the button and it is published, right? In that medium, on that medium, if something is not updated for last six months, it cannot be considered to be current. So avoid finding information from such sites which is not regularly being updated. Now, coming to information use, see, uh, you know, research, uh, no one can do research in isolation. It is only discoveries which can be carried out in isolation. Research can never take place in isolation. Research itself says what? Research. So what we can research, we can research something which is already existing. So how do we do research? We do research on already existing facts, ideas, and opinions. How we do that? We do that by way of borrowing. And how we borrow? We borrow by three ways. Either we quote something, or we summarize something, or we paraphrase something. Now, when we talk about information use, the third way of borrowing, paraphrasing is important. So what you can see on your screen is there is a small paragraph at the top. This is the original paragraph. And without understanding the paragraph, a researcher has tried to paraphrase. What he has tried to done, he has tried to change some keywords, 
some terms and he has tried to change the voice of the sentence. This is not paraphrasing. What you need? This is imitation. What you need? You need to understand the original paragraph. Right? Once you have understood the original paragraph, then you need to rewrite that paragraph in your own language. So what you need to do? You need to rewrite your understanding. This is paraphrasing. The earlier one is imitation of a paragraph. That is not required. What is required in, in a paraphrase is your understanding of the paragraph to use that information in a particular document for a particular purpose in a particular context. So use of information is dependent on your understanding of the information. For summarizing, you need to find out everything what is there related to your research in a particular document and then you can summarize. Right? Now, coming to the last skill set, this is called information use ethics. And I, I feel this is uh, uh, haunting much of the scholars today, uh, particularly when we speak about the plagiarism. So I have told you that research does not take place in isolation. We do it by borrowing, uh, by uh, different ways of borrowing. When we talk about research ethics, it could be diverted by way of a research misconduct, which includes of fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. If you fabricate the data, if you lie for the data, or if you plagiarize, this is called research misconduct, or you are not following the research ethics. Friends, your plagiarism could be intentional or unintentional, but it is not a matter. If you are the researcher, if you are the author of a document where plagiarism is there, you are responsible for it. And there are very serious penalties, right? So we, we need to avoid plagiarism from different sources of information which is already existing. Coming to self-plagiarism, uh, I can, I'm the author and I can quote myself or I can uh, take my, uh, my information or a table or something or a scale. You know, self plagiarism is not contributing to your research. It should be avoided. But if it is essential, uh, then it should be taken as if you are taking from some other source. And it should be properly cited or properly attributed. Right? Now, the question is, how we can avoid it? And I, I'm sure it might be haunting the minds of all the participants here. How you can avoid plagiarism? And this is very simple. How? Be honest. Honest to whom? Honest to yourself. Honest to your learning. Honest to your friends, your family, your supervisor, your teacher. Everything. You know, see, if as a researcher, if you are not in a position to voice your ideas your own, in your own words, take it for, take it guaranteed. You are not going to learn this ever in your life. You know, you are learning as a researcher, someone is learning. So what he should learn, he should learn how to voice his ideas, which is which are there in his mind, in his or her own words. So once you have learned, once you have control on the language, you can avoid. So be honest to everything and cite the things properly. Improper citation also constitutes plagiarism. Right? Improper citation also constitutes plagiarism. If you are not able to read the original document, and if you are trying to cite from the secondary source, please cite the secondary source that you have read this paper in this source and there are provisions for citing the secondary source along with the primary source. So cite everything properly. The second uh, uh, advice from my end is be organized. 
from the beginning till the end of your research, if you are organized, you are not going to commit plagiarism. How you could be organized? See, you should be organized from the very first draft of your research report. See, uh, let me give you a hypothetical example, and this is very practical. Although it is hypothetical, but it is very practical. I am a researcher. I have uh, collected hun hundred of research papers, which I will be using in writing my research report. For convenience, what I have done, I have numbered those papers from one to hundred. So while writing my first draft, what I am doing, whatever I am summarizing, I am writing the number of paper because I know this. I have taken from this paper. Whatever I am paraphrasing, I am writing the number of paper. I know this paper is with me. I am I'm taken. I have taken it from there. Uh, can you allow me one minute, please? Namaskar, ma'am. G ma'am, G ma'am. मैम मैम एक सिस्टम होता है कोई बात कोई बात मैं मैं आपको बता दूं I'm sorry, uh, I had to attend a call because it was very important. So, we need to be organized. Okay, I was given, uh, giving you an example. So, whenever I'm citing a document, I'm giving the number, any of the number from 1 to 100. Unfortunately, when I'm trying to go for my third draft of the research report, some of the research papers are misplaced. And you know, this is very serious. You cannot backtrack citations if you have not noted the references. This is very difficult, right? So what we do, we keep the information and we remove the citation. This is plagiarism. So how you can be organized? See, from the very first drop, whenever you are summarizing something, before in the text, you put a capital S, along with the reference to remind you that you have summarized this from this source. Whenever you are quoting something, put a capital Q before and after the text, along with the reference to remind you that you have quoted this and this is the source. And whatever you are paraphrasing, put a capital P before and after the text, along with the references to remind you in different versions of your draft that this you have paraphrased. This way, you could be systematic. You could be organized and try to use your own language 
uh, in your research report as much as possible. Properly quote everything, paraphrase and summarize. Your citations must be proper. The references, the references must be accurate. Use one citation format, one citation style, and everything should be correct. Right? No additional space, no additional comma, semicolon, full stop, nothing. It should be proper in the proper style. And before submission for award of degree or for publication, please check it for similarity. And if there are similarity, find the reason and remove it. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, all from my side for today. If there are any questions, I'm, I will be happy to answer. Pradeep, check if there is any question or ask uh, participants to post their question in chat box. Pradeep. Uh, thank you, sir. Nice presentation. Today we learned about uh, information skills in 21st century from today's discussion. We have learned the open access resource and information needs about information access and information access in search engine. We also learned what is plagiarism, how to avoid plagiarism. This presentation is really very helpful to our research and also every research scholars. Thank you, sir, for talk, uh, taking your valuable time to give your valuable speech. Thank you. Thank now, you, Dr. Siman Chalan. He's, he has written something on the chat box. Thank you. If you have any questions, then write in the chat box. Hmm. To uh, audience, let me just know from you one thing uh, by my curiosity. Uh, so far, I recollect uh, in the third step and slide number six, uh, you might have several uh, guidelines that how to proceed with the third step. There I found that software engineering and software re-engineering. So uh, if you just uh, explain that what we actually want to mean by software engineering and what is by software engineering, then I think audience will be more benefited. What you are asking? Software, software engineering, engineering and software re-engineering. This is, this is for retrieval of information. You, yeah. can, you should use, if you, are looking for, if you are looking for information of software engineering, you can also I, use the term software re-engineering. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, if uh, it is now open for the participants, if anybody asks any question, please unmute yourself and raise voice. Bandana Madam, do you have any question? Bandana Khandilwal Madam? Okay, there is a request to share the presentation. I will share the presentation with the organizer and he will send it to you. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. Sir, uh, uh, that thing, sir, is, it is very... Yes, please speak. What happened? Hello. Oh, I think he has network issue. He has now exit from the online and I think he will re-log in. If anybody have any question by this time, Okay, sir. Right, then we conclude uh, the session. Hello, sir. Thank yeah. you, Rajesh Singh, sir. Very impressive. Uh, very, I enjoyed a lot and learned so many things from Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, without losing much time, as Singh, sir, is busy, uh, I guess it. And uh, uh, before winding it up, let me invite my colleague Dr. Tapos Kumar Das, who is supposed to be our deputy librarian and in charge Kalabhavan library, to offer a word of thanks. Tapos Da, please. Thank you, Nivaida, for giving me this opportunity. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you, sir. 
uh, a very good afternoon to one and all in particular the resource person and the participants of this session vishwavati library network uh, organizes a uh, five day national level programs on research academy skill development started from 15 january and uh, to uh, today is the fourth day of this program and so on behalf of vishwavati library network i would like to take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks who are directly and indirectly related to with this program at the outset i would like to convey deep regards and hearty thanks to our today's speaker dr uh, rajesh sin university librarian university of delhi uh, for his for his uh, informative deliberation on the topic of the 21st century information skill dr sin has covered different aspects of information like information access search techniques to the through uh, uh, research, through the search engine to find the relevant information how can find the relevant information using the search engine and information evaluation information use so so many important things he has covered so we are very happy and we benefited to hear your speech thank you so much sir for your informative lecture i also express thank you very much uh, i also express our uh, gratitude to dr nimai chand shah our university librarian vishwavati for his guidance and providing encouragement for this program and uh, <clears throat> he also uh, for his whole hearted uh, support to make this program a grand full success i would like like to express our gratitude to all the participants also who join this program from different parts of india and also make this program a grand success i am also helpful uh, thankful to our colleagues particularly sri pradeep hemram assistant librarian and uh, uh, ram prasad mojumdar information scientist vishwarathi and also other uh, staff members who are directly and indirectly related to this program so thanks you once again to all of you thank you sir thank you namaskar yeah yeah thank you singh sir i do solicit your this kind of kind cooperation for future endeavor to run with yeah and uh, of course we are eagerly waiting to invite you in physically in this land of gurudev tagore as well as the first heritage campus uh, in the world so i am looking forward to that days i think you will not uh, decline my invitation once i get the opportunity i am very keen to bring thank him you. in the campus physically okay thank, thank you so much sir have a nice day Okay great so let us now